Hi, I'm John Mad Dog Hall. I'm the executive director of Linux International. And let me tell you, $350 and that will get you a cup of coffee in Starbucks almost any place, right? If you're not the director of Linux International, the coffee is only $250 a cup. Now, I will warn you that there's still going to be strong opinions in this. You've heard opinions this whole week, right? Starting off with Bruce Perens and his keynote. There's a lot of opinion there. And I'm going to give you some other opinions. And I'll also, but I'll try and back up some of these opinions with at least some facts that will allow you to make your decision as to whether they're right or wrong. My lawyers tell me I have to keep reminding people that Linux is a trademark of Linus Torvalds in several countries around the world, and we have to protect that. But unlike a lot of people who have trademarks, Linus wants everybody to use the word Linux for any legitimate purpose. So if you'd like to have a Linux brand of cars or a Linux brand of clothes or something like that, that's perfectly okay. It's just we ask that you register your trademark with us so that we can protect it. Now, I will tell you that if you want to have a Linux pornography site, we're going to refuse your license. And so you're going to get a, uh, a nasty letter from our lawyer and stuff when that's actually happened. And GNU, of course, is a trademark of the Free Software Foundation, and they've done a, a lot of work, and I take off my hat to Richard Stallman and all the people that work for the Free Software Foundation. And Unix is a trademark of XOpen that they use to brand systems as being Unix or Unix compatible. Should I back up there, Scott? Did I start when I shouldn't have or something? Are you okay? Okay. All right. So who am I for the people out there who are new to, to Linux and stuff like that? And why in the world should you be listening to me? Well, I've been a long time in computer science. I started out in 1969 when I picked up a correspondence course on how to program the IBM 1130 in Fortran. And I learned from that book how to do the programming, and I practiced from the 1130. And then when I graduated, uh, unfortunately back in those days there was no degree in computer science because there wasn't any computer science. It was more like computer black magic. We didn't know what we were doing, we were just stumbling along. And we had some guiding lights, people like Grace Mary Hopper, Eckert Moakley, uh, Maurice Wilk, other people, other greats. And so in 1973, I graduated with a weird degree, commerce and engineering. It was half business and half engineering. So I didn't know enough business to really do business. I didn't know enough engineering to do engineering. But I knew enough of each so that the other group couldn't lie to me. And then eventually I got a master's degree in computer science in about 1977, and I went to teach for a while. I've been doing Unix ever since 1980 when I went to work for Bell Labs. And I met Linus Torvalds in May of 1994 where I saw Linux for the first time. This, of course, was three years after he started the Journal Project. And by that time, there was probably about 124,000 people who were actively working and using and trying to improve the Linux system. So a lot of people think I've been doing Linux since day one. That's not true. I was just a person who happened to be in a certain place at a certain time. I've had many different jobs in my life. I've been a programmer. I've been a systems administrator. I've been a product manager. I've been a technical marketing manager. I've worked for large companies. At the Life and Casualty in 1973, had 500,000 nine-track tapes in their tape library and the three-acre computer center. We automatically ordered every, two of everything that IBM produced. So when they announced something, we were the first company to get two of whatever they made, whether it's a new tape drive or a new mainframe. And I've worked for small companies, very small companies. And most importantly, I've been both a customer and a vendor. 
and I have a rough idea of how both of them work. So that's why I'm here. And I hope that I can impart some of the things I've learned over the time. Now the first time I ever, first account I ever heard, if anybody using Unix, and particularly as a firewall, <laughs> was in Istanbul in 1453 AD. There was this guy named Hemet the Conqueror, and he had this harem, and he used black Unix to guard him. Now I can only assume that black Unix is it's one that, you know, it's easy to break into or something, you know, versus white Unix being a really good one, but hey, whatever. Or vice versa, I don't know. <laughs> but, the first time that I really, you know, you know, computers really started to get into it, it was about the period of 1943 to 1977. I want to take you back to those days, because computers were huge and expensive and slow and when I say huge, I mean huge physically, but logically they were very small. In fact, the early computers, if you had, you know, 128 bytes, not, not gigabytes, not megabytes, not kilobytes, bytes of memory, you had a lot. And they were slow, 100,000 operations a minute in the very beginning, related to go to a second. And most of the software that was written, and for a long time computers didn't even have stored programs, they didn't have software. You programmed them with plugs and stuff like that, or other types of things that controlled them. But when you did start to write software, it was distributed in source code, and sometimes it wasn't even an operating system. The concept that we're familiar with of shrink wrap simply did not exist because there wasn't enough of a market for it. There might have, at the beginning, there might only have been 50, 60, 100 computers in the world. <laughs> Why did anybody bother to shrink wrap software? Now, free software did exist. When I was a student in 1969, I couldn't afford much software, and software was very expensive. And there was this organization called DICAS, the Digital Equipment Corporation Use of Society. And they had a library of software that people wrote, basically because they had a, a need. And, you know, for a text editor, or for some accounting software, or, or for whatever, scientific software. And they would write the software, and then at the end they would say, what am I going to do with it? The concept of selling it to somebody else, that means you have to market it, you have to you know, sell it, you have to get you know, taxes, lawyers, and stuff like that. And most people said, hey, you know, I wrote it, what the heck, I'll give it away to somebody else. Maybe I can help somebody else. Or, maybe those people will look at it and say, hey, I can help you improve it, and I'll be happy to do that. And so that's another reason for sharing your software. And maybe you go to a DECUS meeting and somebody will say, hey, you know, I use your software and it's really great. Let me buy you a beer. Yeah. Or maybe buy you a dinner if it was really good, right? Or, or I really like your software. I like the way you wrote it. Maybe I can give you a job. And so, you know, there's all the different reasons why people write free software today and more or less. But see, the software didn't come across the internet because there wasn't any internet. The software you had to get on paper tape. And you would get this catalog on paper from Decus and you'd look through it, oh, that's a cool piece of software, and you look over there and there's the price. It's five dollars. Now remember this is 1969. Five dollars would buy you ten pitchers of beer. And so as a college student, I had this choice. Text editor, 10 pitchers of beer. I think you can see which direction I tended to go. <laughs> but see, the software was actually free as in freedom. So what Deacus was offering you was the service of storing the software on a computer system, of publishing the catalog, of mailing out the catalog, of taking the software, punching it onto paper tape, and mailing that to you. That was a service. 
And once you got the software on that paper tape, you were perfectly free to go ahead and get more paper tape from the school store and run it through your ASR 33 teletype and make more copies. And then you could take those copies and you could sell them to all of your friends for a dollar a copy and get back your five dollars. So then you could have your text editor and your ten pages of fear. And there was lots of tape, lots of different programs there, and Deke just went on. Now, about 1969, these very large, very expensive computers started to drop in price. Things called mini computers started to come in. And these are things that weighed, you know, probably less than two tons and cost less than a couple million dollars. But they were still pretty expensive. And the memories were measured in thousands of bytes, you know, kilobytes. And, but the cost was reasonable. And the speed was reasonable. And so people said, well, you know, instead of writing my software to take care of every little nit and every little cycle, maybe I can make my software a little bit portable. Maybe I can, I can make it so that the operating system can be useful across different machines. And so the concept of Unix as an operating system came out. Now, let me tell you something, folks. It wasn't made portable because Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie had this wonderful vision that said it was going to be portable. That didn't happen. It was portable because they first put it on a PDP-7 that was sitting in the hallway of Bell Labs. And then when that ran out of steam, they coerced somebody into buying them a PDP-11. And when they started to use that, they go, uh-oh, everything's written in the assembly language of the PDP-7. Boy, was that stupid. Let's rewrite it in the assembly language of the PDP-11. But at the same time, let's invent this language called C that might make it a little bit more portable in the future. And so they actually rewrote the first Unix three times. First time in PDP-7, second time in PDP-11 in assembly language, and the third time in C. And then they decided to move it to another computer, an Interdata 832. And they said, geez, even though it's written in C, it's still hard because we have all the parts of the system hooked in together. What we should do is separate it into two parts the part that's the same for every computer system, and the part that really has to change as you go from system to system. The computer independent part and the computer dependent part. And so they rewrote it again to do that. And a little bit later they rewrote it again because they made some mistakes. And then it really started to spread out. Now the reason I've told you this little story is because a lot of people thought that Ken and Dennis wrote in, went and wrote this wonderful operating system in the very beginning, made it portable, and that was the end. It wasn't. Not the way it happened. It happened very pragmatically of lots of little things coming together at one time. A lot of people think that the, that the vendors of computer systems make their operating systems different to lock those customers in. We had a big thing with Mr. C.J. Coppersmith today about lock in, right? But you know something? Don't give them that much credit. They didn't really do that. What they were really trying to do at the very beginning was make their operating system and their hardware meet a specific need and a specific customer base. And so IBM, that was commercial customers, did a batch-oriented style of system. Digital, that did a lot of scientific and work, they did real-time and time-sharing. You know, you know, if, 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 if Digital Equipment Corporation wanted to lock their customers into using PDP-11, they could have done that with only two operating systems, RSX11 and RT11. But instead, they had 11 different operating systems running on their PDP-11. 
Some of them were oriented towards the hospital scene called Mumps. And then there were other ones called IAS. And there was RISTIS for educational purposes. They were trying to make their operating systems meet the needs of the customers. But again, they didn't know what they were doing. Okay? They were going forward kind of blindly. And Unix was one of the first operating systems that said, hey, we're going to make the kernel and the library so simple and so flexible that you can actually do whole bunches of different stuff with it. And I remember back in the early days of Unix, we said, if Unix isn't fast enough for you, wait a week and you'll get a faster processor. And we still say that today in a lot of ways. So there was no evil plot for the companies to tie their customers in. That was just a marketing thing that they dreamed about later on. Okay? Unix was the operating system that was portable, ended up being portable across hardware architectures. And this preserved the human resources needed for both programming and the use of the system. Now, one more thing happened in 1969, little noticed by most people in the world, but in Helsinki, Finland, two people noticed that Linus Torvalds was born. Linus's mother and father. Well, Linus himself, I guess. <laughs> Grandparents, too, probably, yeah. Now, in the meantime, Unix was spreading across all these universities. Ken Thompson gave a talk about it one day, and it kind of escaped, and the university said, hey, can we have a copy? This was kind of cool. And but Unix was not free. Everybody thinks, oh, Unix is open, Unix is free. Unix wasn't free. If you were not a research university, it cost you 160,000 US dollars to buy Unix for one computer system. And if you wanted it on a second computer system, it was another $160,000. If you wanted it on a third one, it's another $160,000 because this is a telephone company. They did not understand volume discount. And I was, I was in Hartford State Technical College, small two-year technical college. I wanted to show my students what the code for Unix looked like. And I called them up and they told me how much it was, $160,000. I almost fell over backwards. My dean of instruction just ended up laughing hysterically. But if you were a selected university, a Columbia, a CMU, a Berkeley, a Stanford, you know, that type, a research university, where you could get it for $350 with the provision that you signed the license that AT&T gave you that said that you would protect the source code from being seen by your students, which everybody, of course, ignored. <laughs> and so later on, there came out this concept of contamination issues, that you seen the source code for Unix and therefore, if you take the knowledge that you learn from that and apply that to writing another operating system, that you may owe AT&T royalties because of that. And that kept a lot of people from going into working for companies, making their own operating systems. And I still have the little buttons that say, I saw the Unix source code, so sue me. And another one that says, keep your lawyers off my computer. I was thinking about bringing them back out again because they're good buttons and, they, and they're still just as good today, obviously. And people protected back in those days their intellectual property through the concept of trade secrets. And there were so-called trade secrets in AT&T Unix, which everybody had seen. And out of all of this came a distribution of Linux called the Berkeley Software Distribution and through a very ugly court battle, uh, Berkeley proved that they could distribute their distribution of software uh, free of AT&T licensing. Now, again, this whole period was in the period of between about 1980, 81, 82, 83. 
And there was this group of companies called, or a group of, of people called Unix, and they would have conferences like this one, where they would discuss Unix systems and advances and everything like that. And people would get up, talk about their projects, and say, "No, yeah, isn't this a great project?" And people say, "Yes, and I'd love to help you on that." Where can I get the source code? And in the early days, the people would say, "Oh, you can UUCP the source code." I mean, that's the that's a way of copying stuff back in those days. UUCP the source code on, on your 1200 bit per second modem over to your system and work on it. Or I have my magnetic tape with it, and it would take it down a computer room and copy it onto your magnetic tape, and that's the way you can get it. But what was happening as Unix systems started to go commercial, and Sun Microsystems, for instance, started to produce a binary-only version of Unix, which is followed rapidly by Hewlett Packard and, and Digital Equipment Corporation. And as these companies were started to fund computer science research at universities with the provision that they, the funding of the research not be made public, be made kept private, then more of these people would come to Usenix and talk about what they were doing, but at the end, when people ask them for the source code, they say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you because I work for Sun, or I'm paid, my research is paid for by these other people. And the Usenix people would go, <laughs> But over the years, the hissing and booing got less because people became more used to it. It became the norm. And people forgot what it was like to get the source code and look at it and change it and work with it and try and make it better and make it meet their needs, make it fit the way they wanted the source code to work. Other things that were problems back in the Unix period was that because these companies were distributing this Unix system under a binary-only license that did not force them to, dis to make the source code available to everybody, it started to change. And Sun Microsystems' code was different from Digital's code, was different from AT&T's code. And so you couldn't easily write the same program and put it on all these different systems. And this was more than just the code. They had different names for it. It wasn't Unix on Sun, it was Sun OS, and later Solaris, and Altrix, and then later OSF1, and then from IBM, AIS, and from HP, HPUX, and Xenix, and Cisco 5. And it confused the marketplace because all these different names were basically the same thing. It should have been Unix. Unix from digital, Unix from Sun, Unix. And all these companies said, yeah, we're making our Unix system even better than everybody else's Unix system. And what they were missing was the fact that what the customers really wanted, yes, they wanted Unix to move forward, but they wanted the same Unix system on everybody's hardware. They wanted the same systems administration across all of their systems. They didn't want to have a different systems administration over here and over there just because one day they bought the system from IBM and the next day they bought the system from HP. But the vendors didn't understand or listen to this message. And finally, they formed a group called the Open Software Foundation, OSF, and Sun and AT&T formed one called USL, Unix Systems Labs, and there was a great deal of money and energy and, and much horribleness of this fight between these two organizations trying to define what Unix was going to become. And they still didn't listen to the customers who kept saying, I really want the same thing just across all my different vendors. Now, in the period between 1977 and 83, another phenomenon came about. The computer systems that used to be millions of dollars and then hundreds of thousands of dollars were now coming down to the tens of thousands of dollars. 
and really wacko nutcases like me would go out and spend $10,000 on a hobbyist computer system that had 4K of memory, no disk drive, no screen, I hooked my TV set up to it, a keyboard that weighed 700 pounds, and, and, and a mouse? We didn't have, we didn't have mice. You know, what, what's a mouse? I mean, we just a keyboard, the, the, the TV set, and this box, right? It probably did about 250,000 instructions a second. But man, it was cool. <laughs> and, uh, and we started writing you know, code for this and stuff. And you get these magazines with page after page of hexadecimal numbers that you would then type in. And, and then the next month, the magazine would publish the apology because they put an F where there was supposed to be an E. And that's why your thing didn't work and why you ripped out the hair from here to here, right? And, I, and, and I, I definitely went through three levels of glasses trying to strain at, at half-printed you know, characters in the magazine or when the dog ripped it up or something like that. And there was stuff with bulletin boards and people sharing programs back and forth and everybody was sharing this. And then all of a sudden, it almost every night, it was like people decided, let's make money selling this software. Because... The commercial software was still so expensive, but what would happen if we could manufacture this software, just like they're manufacturing the microcomputers? And we sell it for a much lower price to lots of people. And that's when the computer stores started to appear. And it wasn't a bad idea at the beginning. You know, I can make a program that might meet 70 or 80 or 90 percent of the needs of 60% of the people. Is that so bad? I mean, it's particularly if the price is reasonable. Instead of charging a million dollars a copy for it, I could charge a thousand dollars a copy and sell it to a thousand customers. And, you know, and I actually did buy some of this software about that time too, you know. A little company that had a hundred engineers. They developed this product that was pretty cool. I, I forget what it was. But I do know I paid about $1,000 for it. And I got it, you know, with documentation and stuff. I put it in my computer system, and it worked. I was using it for a while, and I ran into a bug, and I called up the company, and I got the president of the company on the line. I said, hi, you know, I, one of your customers bought your software, had this problem. Oh, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, I, we can fix it. We'll have it fixed tomorrow. And he could say that because he was also the chief programmer. And he says, and we'll have it out to you the day after that. And he could say that because he was the chief of QA. He was also the chief shipping clerk. <laughs> you know, and it was great. And I got it, and I stuck it in. It worked. It was fixed. And then and it, along with that, was a little piece of paper that said, hey, if you have any ideas about how we can improve it, so I filled it out, sent it back. And you might figure that all the rest of the customers might do the two things. Join the course and get one bug and one request for new functionality. 2,000 pieces of paper coming back to the 100 engineers, 20 pieces of paper per engineer. They work on it. The new release has all this new stuff in it. Everybody's happy. No problem. But time goes on. Now, 2005. Same company's growing a little bit. They got 150 engineers. They got 300 marketing people. But they got 4.5 million customers. And those customers generate one problem report, one request for new functionality, and send them to the company, and the 9 million pieces of paper end up on the desk of the 150 engineers. 60,000 pieces of paper per engineer. You see the problem. Folks, it's not that the companies don't want to make their software good. It's not that they don't want to give you good service. It's that they can't. It's impossible. Lots of times we give talks like this to places like CBIT and stuff, and I may have 4,000 business people in the room. It doesn't make any difference how many, 2,000, 1,000, doesn't make any difference. I ask them four simple questions. Question number one, have you ever had a problem with proprietary closed source software? Now this is like asking, can you jump to the moon? 
You know, I mean, I know the answer, right? Out of the 4,000 business people, 3,999 hands go up. And the reason the last one doesn't go up is because they're asleep. So I asked the second question. How many of you have ever taken the time to write a well-worded work, uh, to write a, a well-worded description of your problem and send it to the manufacturer? And out of the 4,000 business people, probably 3,500, 3,000 or 3,500 will raise their hands because these are business people. They paid money for the software and they expect it to work. Foolish people. And I'll say, okay, of the people with your hands raised, how many of you have ever gotten back a well-worded workaround or bug fix? And now, almost without fail, all the hands in the room will go down except for maybe 50 or 60 or 70 people out of 4,000. And I think this is a very bad statement about the statement about the state of software development today. I'll ask them one final question of the 4,000. How many of you have ever had to change the way you do business because the software which you purchased would not allow you to do business the way you want to? And this includes you getting an update to the software that you open the package, put it on your computer system, and it doesn't look anything like the old version did. And so you have to retrain your people or whatever. And sure, you can try and keep using the old version, but sooner or later you find out that the new applications you buy tell you you have to use this version of the software or above. Or that you can't get new hardware and put your old version of the operating system on it. And so you're stuck with following the upgrade path that that vendor has made for you. And did, they, and did they ask you whether you wanted all those changes? No. They just gave them to you. This causes even loss of sales. It can be that the new interface is so complicated that the people that you have using it make mistakes. How many of you have ever gone to a website and found a web page that was so complex that you try and order something and it just you, you, you just can't get it through. And after a while, after a while, what do you do? You go to somebody else, right? You try and find some other product or some other person selling that because you've given up trying to get through. But software freedom allows you to make certain decisions about that software. You could decide to keep using the previous version. And you could decide that it's better to hire somebody to help you put it to new hardware, to fix that bug that you found, to fix the security leak that's there, rather than go to that new version. And it's the source code availability that allows you to make that decision. Now, another way of looking at this is that if you figure that every piece of software is buggy, which is not a bad, not a bad thing, or every piece of software doesn't necessarily meet the needs of the person using it, then there's a, there's a gap in between what the software does and what you would really want it to do. You want it to work perfectly all the time. You want it to meet every single one of your needs, but it doesn't. And if that little gap in there costs you a dollar a day in some type of issue, the system crashes, you lose the term paper you've been working on, or the, or the business plan, or the thesis, or whatever. The virus attack comes in and shuts down your whole organization for a day. Everybody goes home while the systems administrator cleans it up. The printer that you bought last week doesn't really work the way it's supposed to, you know, and you can't get the operating system vendor to, to make the fix you need. 
any number of different things. You're trying to get two pieces of software to, to work well together, and you've written that glue code every possible way you can, and it just won't work well. If you could just change one or the other of the packages, that glue code would work a lot better. But you can't. And so it causes you a little bit of a gap in usefulness of your software. Now, if that only costs you a dollar a day, and you had a thousand workstations in your premises, that's a thousand dollars a day on average that you're losing from productivity. And while I'm not so Pollyanna to think that open source software is going to reduce that dollar loss a day to zero, you might be able to hire somebody to close that gap, to do some fixes to the software, and so you lose less. And it, it really starts to gain on us. Because today, there's approximately 500 million general purpose computers, desktop, server systems, so forth. The problem with that, and so in reality, if we lost a dollar a day for every one of those systems, as a world economy, we're losing $500 million a day. But the thing is, there's 6.3 billion people in the face of the planet, which means that 5 million, 5 billion, 500 million people have not selected their operating system yet. And what happens as those people come in and start to use it? How big is that gap going to get? Now, a lot of people talk about total cost of ownership. You go out to the web, you'll see all these studies done by Microsoft, sponsored by Microsoft or whatever, trying to prove that the total cost of using Linux is more than the total cost of using Microsoft. And they'll say, hey, you know, we, we, we've done this the best we can. We took our Microsoft user, and we gave them Linux, and then we had to retrain them in how to use Linux. And that training process made the cost of ownership go above what it would be if they continued using Microsoft. Well, we can all see the hole in that logic. Because if they had started with Linux and knew nothing about Windows, then the total cost of ownership would probably be about the same. But I'm going to argue that the total cost of ownership is useless. Because that's only talking about what the software costs. It doesn't talk about what the software is worth. If you take a piece of software, buy it, buy it from the store, take it home, put it on your system, install it, you spent a certain amount of the cost of the software, buying it, your time in installing it. You fire it up, and the software does absolutely nothing, just craps out on you. What's the value of that software? Zero. Now you go ahead and you use the software, same thing, buy a piece of software, put it on your computer, start it up, and it does your taxes, walks your dog, cooks your food, and, and, you know, and, and gives you advice about how to live life. The value of that software is probably pretty high. Do you care how much you had to pay for it? No, because the value of that software was so high, you would have paid a million dollars for it. The value of the software. And then when you go along and you think about how much are the costs that are hidden? The cost of outages. The cost of failure. There's a saying at one time, nobody was ever fired because they bought IBM. Don't believe that. There were lots of people fired when they bought IBM. Some people say, nobody's fired because they buy Microsoft. I can introduce you to plenty of people. You're fired because you can't do what your boss wanted you to do. That's why you're fired. It doesn't make any difference who you bought. It was a mistake. With open source software, you have a better chance of making the software 
do what you need to. Now, back to our timeline. It's 1990. Minus Torvalds has gotten a brand new 386 system for Christmas. And he recognizes the fact that the software that came with it just doesn't utilize all of the power of that 386 chip. Now, I can't blame the company that made that operating system, right? Because they had to support 286s, 186s, 8086s, you know, all those old crappy pieces of Intel architecture that were wonderful at the time that I paid $10,000 for, but now weren't worth third. But they still had to support it. Yet Linus knew there was an operating system that could take advantage of the hardware of that chip, and that was the Unix operating system. But it cost a lot of money. $1,200 for SCO Linux on the desktop. $700 for interactive Linux. And he didn't have that money. And so he said, I think I'll write my own operating system. Well, fortunately, by that time, there was a lot of stuff around that could help him. A lot of GNU code, lots of open source code, even though we didn't call it open source. But there were other things. Bruce Perens, in his, in his keynote at the beginning of this week, he said, you know, oh well, open source happened because of this and that, but it happened because of other things too. Things that came together at a particular point in time. High-speed internet, so that people could even have high-speed internet in their home. First it was in universities, then it was in their home. Knowledge about how to write an operating system. Back in 1969, there was only one book written and published on how to write an operating system. And it was printed on a chain printer so that the sentences kind of like went up and down the page. It was incredibly hard to read. But today, you go down to the bookstore, and there's lots of books on how operating systems are done. And there's lots of examples of different operating systems that you can actually get the source code for. And there were tools to do remote collaboration that were available that weren't available earlier. And all these things came together to allow Linux to happen. But just because Linux happened, that didn't mean there was a market for it. And so something else happened in 1994 that helped Linux move along. And that was the fact that large numbers of supercomputer companies like Cray and ECL and a whole bunch of others were going out of business. Why? Because it was hugely expensive to build a supercomputer, to design one, make one. And then once you bought it and you paid a lot of money for it, the software for it was also incredibly expensive because each supercomputer vendor had wrote their own operating system, their own compilers, they had their own architecture, and so you, it was hard for you to get software for these systems. And two people, Dr. Thomas Sterling and Dr. Donald Becker said, what would happen if we took commodity-based chips and systems and hook them together with cheap networking and decompose the problems and make the equivalent of a supercomputer out of it for about one fortieth of the price. And there's two parts to this. Not only was it a cheap computer, but if you made it out of Intel chips with a combination of this operating system that was the same across all, you actually created a binary interface so that people in Los Alamos labs who was creating a Beowulf system, could have their applications run on a Beowulf system built by somebody at Argonne Lab. And it could solve huge numbers of problems. Not every problem, but a lot of problems that people really cared about. Weather forecasting, image rendering, Trek 2, Titanic. 160 alpha systems running alpha Linux 
helped to render the movie Titanic. They could have done it with one alpha system, but it would have taken 160 years, and Leonardo DiCaprio wouldn't look as good as he does today. Right? Image recognition, being able to, to, to scan an image and see whether that's a sailboat down there or a submarine conning tower. You need to know that very quickly. Because if you make a mistake and you launch your missile at the sailboat, it just ruins your whole day. Paperwork alone is pretty bad. Global warming. I had a friend of mine create a Beowulf system out at Los Alamos Labs called Loki. Sixteen processors working together. He, he used it to find out what would happen if meteors hit the United States. And for a long time, he had them hit New York City. You know, bing, there goes the Statue of Liberty. After 9-11, he switched to Los Angeles, but... Seismic imaging. Boy, it would be great to have that for the Dasami, right? You might have been able to predict it a little bit better. Genome research. And here's an example where open source is not just the operating system. When you're doing genome research, you generate huge amounts of data. Well, if you're using a proprietary closed source database and you want to share that data with somebody else, you can't just give them an image of that database, you know, a backup of the disk, here it is. You have to unload the data from that database, put it onto some type of media, send it to your friend. If they don't own that database engine, they have to buy a license. Maybe they're in a, in a country that's hard to afford a license for that, you know, $8,000, $10,000. Or maybe they can't even get it because they're not allowed to ship that software to an Arab country or to Cuba. And in any case, you want to do, do work with them, and they then have to load that software back into the database. It's hard and it's time consuming. With MySQL, you can say, okay, I'm going to take an image of the disk, here it is. With this license these days, sometimes you say, here's the whole disk, you know, just forget about it. Return it to me when it's empty, you know. I bought a quarter terabyte disk the other day. I just love saying that, quarter terabyte. <laughs> $350 to copy with a... Lots of things. Calculating financial research. Now, that's an odd one, isn't it? But there's a reinsurance company, I won't tell you where they are, a reinsurance company that built a Beowulf system and shortened the calculation time of figuring out how much they were going to charge for reinsuring something from a week down to 10 minutes. How do they use this? They're on a telephone with all the other reinsurance companies and the client insurance company. They give their bid for the contract, they're over. The client company says, well, I'm thinking about going with this other company. Wait a minute, what if we do this? And they change the model a little bit, recalculate it, 10 minutes later they have a new bid. Yeah, that's okay. All the other reinsurance companies are going, what in the world? How could he have done that? He couldn't possibly have run that model that quickly. Using the Beowulf system, they generated six times the amount of business that they would have had. They paid for that Beowulf system in the first three weeks they used it. Talk about return on investment talk about value of the software. And these are big and small. You can buy commercial systems like that up there, or you can put it together yourself. And this is Oak Ridge National Labs, took 48 cast-off computers. You can see how the wonderful rack job they have. Those are the keyboards across the top. One of them fell off on the side. And if I showed you the back of it, you would see this thing, this rat's nest of, of wires that was their sophisticated networking. And yet they solved a real supercomputer problem with it. Another thing that happened about this time is that the internet started to explode. And of course, originally, machines that ran the internet were things like Suns and R6000s, HPUX and stuff like that. But all of a sudden, people realized 
but an inexpensive Intel box and this little operating system called Linux had everything that you needed to be an ISP. Multi-using, multitasking, multi-architecture. You could have shell, you know, shell uh, commands. You have shell accounts. You could have web servers. Had everything that was needed, and it was stable. It would stand up. It was secure. And had everything you needed. And almost overnight, people were buying Linux server machines. And you had the source code. And when you're an ISP, you have your machine on the front line. There's nothing to hide behind, folks. That machine is there, people going after it. You, if you have a problem, you need to fix it quickly. A few years ago, there was this problem of a buffer overflow. We called it the ping problem. Windows users found out they could create a packet of almost unlimited size, send it towards some Unix machine, or actually any machine, overflow the buffer in a TCP IP stack, and watch the machine go down like a rock. I worked with Digital Equipment Corporation. We found out about the problem. It took us two and a half weeks to generate the binary patch and get it out to our customers. The open source community, when they understood the problem, took four hours to get the source code patch up on the web. Who got the better service? And this is why InfoWeek magazine in 1997 and 1998 gave their award for best service, not to Microsoft, not to IBM, not to Hewlett Packard or Digital, but to the open source community. Here's some more free software timeline. There were more ports that followed. The Alpha port, there was Spark, Motorola. And each one of these ports has a really unique thing about it. Because if you only put your operating system on one architecture, the people that write it tend to take shortcuts. We call these Intelisms. And then when Intel changes their architecture a little bit and that particular Intelism goes away, then you create an unstable architecture, an unstable system. By putting your operating system to multiple architectures, you're not allowed to take advantage of those shortcuts that happen in the architecture. And so the system becomes more stable. In September of 1998, the databases saw what was happening, and they said, we're going to do porting. And this is the beginning of industry looking at Linux. 1998, six, seven years ago. In October of 1998, large companies started to sit up and take notice of it and say that they were going to support it. And then high availability software started to appear and groups like OSCL went in and started to try and improve Linux to meet what they, you know, the higher needs of the computer industry. In the year 2000, embedded systems companies started to discover Linux. Now, embedded systems are kind of like the opposite side of this. Very tiny systems, of course. And that one system up there with the U.S. quarter beside it, that's a complete server with 32 megabytes of main memory, and on the opposite underside of that is a one gigabyte flash disk. It has an Ethernet and it has a USB on it. That's all you need. Battery, of course. The thing down here at the bottom, this represents an ATM machine in Brazil. The bank that had these machines had been using OS2 as the operating system. And IBM was dropping support for OS2. And their machines were 386s, 486s, low-end Pentium, small amounts of memory, small amounts of disk. They couldn't put Microsoft anything on there. And so they, so they, they chose Linux. 
and they were able to put the same operating system on all their ATM machines. And it was stable, and it was secure, and it had networking that they could network into, and they didn't have to pay any royalties for it, and they didn't even have to ask anybody if they could use it. There were no licenses to sign, no paperwork, no lawyers to talk to. Oh, he's going, okay. No lawyers to talk to, no lawyers to talk to. <laughs> it's very easy for them. And they liked it so much that on the front of every single one of the ATM machines, there's a little penguin. And there were other things, TiVos and robots and kiosks. What happens if you're making 100,000 kiosks and you have to pay $10 royalty for every one of those? That's a million dollars. That's a lot of money. Go and do a lot of other things. About March of 2000, the dot-com started to fail and the recession strikes and, and people said, oh, you know, some of these Linux companies are going out of business. You know, you can't make money with free software. But guess what, folks? Every company starting up starts up not making any money. They have an expense. They have to hire engineers. They're, they pay out money. They pay out money. But soon, they start having customers. And that magic point where the, where the revenues coming in are greater than the expenses going out is called profit. And once you've reached that, you're usually fairly good. If Linux had the market share that Microsoft has today, these companies wouldn't have any problem. They would be wildly profitable because they don't necessarily need to expand their expense line to match up with the revenue coming in. In winter of 2003, Red Hat did become profitable. And for the most part, it's been profitable every quarter after that. Other companies are on the verge of becoming profitable. They just need a little bit more market share. Let's talk about free government, free software in government. We're in a strange place. Most of us in here are United States citizens. We live in the United States. We don't think about things like putting software for the United States in the United States, ships, planes, tanks. But how do you think our generals and our admirals would feel if we said to them, go ahead and take this software from China and put it into your ships and your tanks? Oh, by the way, you can't see the source code for it. You don't know what's in there. They wouldn't be very happy with it. Now let's turn it around and say that you're a general or an admiral in China, and you're asked to take the source code from this company in the United States that, by the way, has been sued by the United States for being a monopoly, and, has, and the United States has lost, and that the CEO of that company cannot even take a pie in the face with any type of grace. You just wouldn't trust that. And it's not even that you don't trust them because there may be some type of Trojan horse in there or something like that, but you can't trust them because of long the longevity that you need that software for. If you go to Munich, Germany, and go to the new town hall in Munich, Germany, it's over 700 years old. The old town hall is another 300 years older than that. The oldest software company in the face of the earth is about 40 years old. And there's been lots of them that have disappeared. And people say to me, well, Mad Dog, that's why I buy my software from a large company, that they won't go out of business. So I say a company like Wang, or Prime, or Data General, or Digital Equipment Corporation, or Compaq. 
And while it's true that digital was bought by Compaq and Compaq was bought by Hewlett Packard, there were products and product lines that were discontinued. Email systems, for instance, that were simply discontinued because Hewlett Packard didn't want to support five email systems. Well, happens all the time. Let's talk about another thing. Again, the United States, we're a pretty prosperous country. We capitalists, stuff like that. And we don't think too much about barriers to entry. But there are barriers to entry. The average Chinese person makes about 60 US dollars a month. Then we tell them, you have to go out and you have to buy a computer system in order to join the world economy. You have to be on the internet to do this, to exchange information. And we say, all you have to do is buy the system and buy, say, Microsoft Office at $600 a copy. That's 10 months worth of work. And they're not allowed to buy any food, or any clothing, you know, do anything like that. That's the equivalent of 40,000 US dollars. If somebody said to you, okay, you, can, you have to buy this piece of software to run your business, but oh, by the way, it's $40,000, I think you would slip a little patch over your eye, and go, R, 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 baby, just buy a software pirate. <laughs> and the Chinese people weren't stupid. They know that it didn't cost, you know, $40,000 to press that shiny plastic disc. In fact, if they go down to their local CD shop, they can get it for $2. I said that in a conference one time, and a person in the back of the room said, One dollar! <laughs> and I knew that they were a tough negotiator. <laughs> but that's only one type of barrier. What about the other barriers, the barriers of language? We're English speakers, for the most part. We don't think about it. Well, some of us speak Australian. <laughs> but you know, we don't think too much about it. But what happens if your language is Hindustani? I was talking with a, a Microsoft product manager one time, and they told me that they were very proud of the fact that Microsoft supported 50 languages. I went back and checked Red Hat. They supported 51. And recently, it was announced with great fanfare that for the first time, Swahili was going to be supported by OpenOffice. And not just the one version of Swahili, but all four different dialects of Swahili. In India, they have two different character sets, 18 different official languages, and 5,000 unofficial languages. What company could possibly support all those languages? And yet, without the source code to be able to do it, those people can't have those programs in their own language. Country of Estonia, 2.5 million people, and believe it or not, they speak Estonian in Estonia. Went to a company and said, please, can we have this in Estonian? No, it's not in our best business interest to do that work for you. Notice what they said. Our, being the company's best business interest to do that for you. What about the Estonian's best business interest? What happened to their best business interest? What happens when the software you need to start your company costs $500,000 a copy. You're a small company, you're trying to start it up. Can you afford that? Probably not. Can you even negotiate, hire the legal staff to negotiate all the software contracts that you need? Let's say you're creating a, an embedded system project. I went to Israel one time and I looked around. Israel, of course, is very up-to-date, modern country. They have a lot of work, a lot of enter entrepreneurialism there, a lot of industry. I looked around and said, where are all of your 
Linux companies over here. I would expect to see more. It said, we're waiting for the letter of authorization. I said, what are you talking about? Oh, you know, if, if we were going to represent Microsoft, we would go to Microsoft and they would give us a letter of authorization saying that we were the representatives of Microsoft in Israel. And then we could take it around to all these different companies and say, look, we are the representatives of Microsoft in this country. Microsoft has blessed us. I said, well, guess what? You're never going to get the letter of authorization. Nobody can give that to you, including Linus Torvalds. They can't give it to you because you have it already. Nobody asks you to sign anything when you start to use free software. Oddly enough, I went to India right from that trip, looked around, no Linux companies, why? Letter of authorization. It's an interesting trip. Software freedom also means less money leaves your country or your economy to go some other place. How much money do we pay for package software that goes out of our economy? Now, a lot of people say to me, Mad Dog, you live in the United States. Shouldn't you be encouraging all these, all these countries to shovel money in your direction? I say you have to understand the United States is actually made up of 50 small countries. I live in the small country of New Hampshire. We have a whole bunch of out-of-work software developers in New Hampshire. And I object to having to send my money to the small country of Redmond, Washington <laughs> for software that doesn't work, software of no value. I'd rather keep it in New Hampshire. I'd rather pull down software off the net and get my software developers to put that together into a solution for me. And I'd rather pay them because they will buy New Hampshire food, New Hampshire housing, and pay New Hampshire taxes. And remember, every dollar that goes out of your economy is actually $10 lost. We are 50 small countries in the United States. And I don't believe that the economy is so simple that if we stop sending money to Redmond, Washington, that the entire United States economy is going to go down the tube. If it was that simple, we wouldn't need Alan Greenspan to explain it to us. Today, Linux is shipping on about a quarter of all the new server systems. Now, I have a slight problem with that number, too, because that's the number that we saw from IDC today. I have a slight problem with that number, because what you ship and what you use may be two different things. If I was buying a server system and I had a chance to pick up a cheap copy of XP, if I thought I was ever going to use it in the future, I might do that. But then I might put Linux on it to do my real work. Or maybe I've had a, a Windows NT system that I've been using and I never really got it to work right, so I put Linux on it and now everything is fine. There are two ships in the United States Navy that are hospital ships, USN Hope and USN Mercy. The Hope is on the East Coast in the Norfolk Naval Yard and the Mercy is on the west coast, down in San Diego. The Mercy uses Linux on all of their server systems aboard ship. And the Hope uses Windows NT. But the Hope is required to have two servers for each function. Because in the United States Naval Principles of Operations, it tells you that you have to reboot the NT server once every 30 days. And if you're at sea when you do that, then you're stuck without the functionality of that server. There is no requirement to reboot Linux every 30 days. And so they get away with having just one server for each function. I like to point out that this is a fine example that when you use Windows NT, you have no hope. 
Guinness is used on most, if all, new supercomputers. Recently, the world's largest supercomputer was announced, 10,240 Itanium processors working together in a single system image in NASA Ames in California. It came online faster than almost any system that they've had experience with for that, that size system. And it's used on most of the top 500 supercomputers. Pat Goda, the guy who had the Loki system, told me the five reasons why a Beowulf system was better than your average pr proprietary supercomputer. Reason number five, it was faster. Reason number four, it was cheaper. Reason number three is that you could typically, that with the supercomputer, you typically had to pay $1.6 million a year maintenance. With the Beowulf system, you had a three-year warranty on all the parts from the manufacturer. Number two reason, when the, when the supercomputer broke, you had to call the, the manufacturer, they had to send out the rep, they had to find out what was wrong, they had to order the parts, they had to come. It was typically down for a day and a half or two days. With the Beowulf system, you went down to Walmart, got a replacement part to fix it yourself, downtime was a quarter of a day. But the real and number one reason why the Beowulf system was better than the supercomputer, you could actually get applications for the Beowulf. Linux is the third most used operating system in new, system, in new embedded, I'm sorry, in new embedded system sites. That does not mean that Linux is used on the majority of embedded devices. There's lots of PDAs out there with Windows CE on them. But each one of those Windows CE systems is a design. And right now, Linux is being used on more new designs than any, it's the third most used system. Windows CE is fourth. And Linux is now outselling Apple on the desktop. It doesn't mean we have a larger installed base than Apple, but system by system being sold, we're outselling them. And the good news is, we don't seem to be taking the market share away from Apple. We're taking it away from the other company. I have a friend of mine who's a systems administrator. He says, Mad Dog, Every day I go home from work, I sit down with my laptop on my lap, and I watch TV with my wife. While she's watching TV, I'm programming. And what I'm writing is all these little utilities that help me do my job. And right before I go to bed, I send them all off to SourceForge, and then I go to bed. When I go into work the next day, I find out that 10,000 other people been doing the same thing. It's like an amplification of what I can do. I could write, try and write all that code myself, but I would never do it. It's an amplification. And so with that, I'd like to thank lots of people, Linux International member companies for helping to make Linux successful. Hossef for paying my way here, SBI who pays my salary so I can come around and give talks like this to people, IBM donated this really nice laptop, but most of all, I'd like to thank the free software community itself, because there's lots of times that people come up to me and say, can I have an autograph, can I have my picture taken with you, da 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 da, and I say to them, if you want to see the most important person in the free software community, when you get up tomorrow morning, just take a look in the mirror. Because even if you don't write code, you can tell other people about it. You can submit bug reports. You can write documentation. You can help people get started. And next year, when this conference is here, I'd like each one of you to bring two non-Linux users here. And the year after that, they'll bring two people, and it'll go on. 
And I would like to thank the Lynx community on behalf of all of these different projects and more, who I believe that these projects could not have existed if they were tried to be done with proprietary software. They would have run into a barrier to entry. And with that, I'd like to thank you for coming. I, we are going to have a drawing, a series of drawings for a series of things. Please don't go running off. He's allowed to run off. <laughs> he's going to go get them. Maybe be. Thank you very much. Scott, would it be easier to have the drawing here or in the other room or what? Okay, good, good. Does everybody take their car in and ask them about this so that you might be able to make some of the basic drawings? If not, let me pass this around because in addition to the drawing, um, our esteemed friend, Mr. Hall, here has created a drawing for us. Can you just have a little bit of a picture of the drawing? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. 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 Yes, the history of the T-shirt was, this T-shirt was actually generated by the Think Geeks group. Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, they were going to have a set of T-shirts that they were called the Uber Geeks T-shirt. And Alan Cox had a T-shirt made for him with a caricature of Alan on it and a little saying from Alan. And then they came to me and they said, we'd really like to do one for you. And they showed me the original penguin they gave me, and it was a big, muscular penguin with big teeth and a wicked grin on his face, and I was scared of it. <laughs> I said, no, 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 you have to understand, I'm a much milder penguin than that. And so the next one they had was a penguin with long gray hair and a gray beard, and holding the globe in his flippers, and saying world domination through world cooperation, which is one of the great things I believe in. And uh, we've had every single one of the speakers here sign this, okay? This is a wonderful thing, particularly if you have a business that deals in Linux, you could, you could put this into a nice picture frame and put it on your wall, okay? You can give it to a loved one who is really enthusiastic about Linux, you know, all that type of stuff. And, uh, and it is for the Sasami victims, okay? And we'll take, in, and if you're gonna write us a check, you can make a check out to the Red Cross, and we'll just slip that in an envelope to them and, and go, go, go. Um, so that's kind of separate, but I want to say that the, the, the other things for, for auction and stuff here uh, and drawing in the clock, I, I'd like some money to go to, to Scott's uh, organization. I mean, he has a nonprofit which is trying to promote Linux and particularly in the educational space. I think that's a very worthy thing and I can tell you that the, that the clock is, is a good clock. Um, I used to make them out of NT CD-ROMs because that was the only thing that NT was good for. <laughs> but I noticed that every once in a while the NT would fall off the wall and crash. <laughs> and the Linux clocks tend to stay on the wall. I did get Linus to sign it, and I asked them, please, Linus, when you sign it, don't just put your normal L line, T line, you know, at, make it so that people can actually read it, but that is his signature. And I will say that the CD it's made out of is one of the original CD-ROMs the Linux Journal had of all of their, of their articles. Each year they put out a, a CD that has all of their articles in the very first copy. This was a prototype of that just to see if people liked it. And so there's some really good articles on there. If you take the car clock apart carefully and stick it in your CD-ROM drive, you can mount it and look at it with an HTML browser. 
So that's uh, basically all the stuff about it. So I can move my out of the way, and you can do whatever you need to do. Do I want to conduct the auction? Sure. I'll hold the judge, and then I'll opt out take care of the draw. Okay, so are we going to auction these or draw these? Well, you wanted to auction. You, you had mentioned that you wanted to auction. We can auction them. We can auction them. Yeah, but you. Okay. So see, the problem is that people think, well, I won't bid on the first one just because probably people pay high prices for that. They don't get the second one. Don't fool yourselves. <laughs> Okay, so for the first book, how much do we bid for this? Now this is a this is brand new, hot off the press. This hasn't been sitting on the bookshelves for like eighteen months or anything like that. You know, these these are the publisher's copies sent to me for the author, you know, showing that hey, it's it's actually out. How much do we bid for the first book? Oh, okay. it's 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 Red Hat, Fedora, Linux for dummies. Now, a lot of you know about Linux. You say, hey, I'm not a Linux dummy, right? You know, I don't need that book. But just think about it. You give it to your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your mother, your son. I've had lots of people tell me that they couldn't get Linux working and use Linux until they got this book, okay? Yeah, and we should all maybe take note of the fact that Fedora is a real success for Hawaii, given that it is the product of Warren Gagami's ICS control class. And uh, this is the embodiment of what we're trying to achieve. And again, whoever wins this, whoever whoever buys this book, I will autograph it to you. Okay, I mean, you know, you tell me what your name is. I can't. I'm not a mind reader, but you tell me what your name is, and I will write something nice about you in it. And then, you know, and that one, and four hundred and fifty dollars will get you that cup of coffee in Starbucks on the same place, right? So how much? And and then this is money that's going to go to this organization, right? So how much money are we going to be bid for this book? Fifty dollars. All right, I I see fifty dollars. What? That's this is Pat McGovern right up there of OSDN. Okay. OSDN. OSD, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Fifty dollars. Anybody want to pay more? I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Anybody else? You know we should. Seventy dollars for Mr. Recovering. Okay. Eighty dollars down here. Okay. Eighty dollars going once. Eighty dollars going twice. Sold to the biggest dummy I know. No, no, no. <laughs> that is obviously for somebody else, right? Okay, okay. All right. And we went to the next book. We could do a drawing. That's right, because now he knows he has his book. And all those people that are waiting to get the second book cheaper, you may have lucked out, or you may have failed. Ah, the clock. Now, folks, I can't tell you how nice this clock is hanging up on your wall. This is not one of those inexpensive, crappy, quartz smooth clocks that the band goes tick, tick, tick. This is a silent, running quartz movement. Now, I, coll I collect and repair mechanical clocks. I am a horologist. <laughs> I know my horse, okay? And this is a wonderful little movement here, okay? It's got a little hanger in the back, and you, and you will treasure this in your office for years. Oh yeah, yeah, MTP server in it. I mean, no, let's see, this is this is a documentation this, but it has a documentation on the MTP server, yes. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But this clock does work, and if it doesn't work, I'll give you my business card, you ha and I'll be happy to guarantee it and make sure it'll work for you. So, how much are we bid for this clock? 
Signed by Linus Linus Torvalds. Yes. Happy Linuxing, Linus Torvalds. That's what he always says. He always says Happy Linuxing. How much we bid for this? Now imagine this clock hanging in your office. Let's say you're a consultant trying to sell Linux services or something like that. And your customer walks in and you say, oh, what time is it? And they look around and go, oh, it's Linus Torvalds. You know, I mean, that's got to be something for you, right? So how come on? How much do we really bid for this clock, right? One hundred dollars for Mr. Pat McGovern up there in the corner. How often is Linus Torvalds autographed? Well, I will admit that this is not the most limited edition in the world, but I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but there is an end to them because, quite frankly, we don't have any more of the little penguin uh, CDs. Okay. So this is not a 100,000 copy thing that's going to be going out here. I mean, the combination of the Linux Journal Sampler CD and Linus's, you know. And besides, anybody that knows Linus knows he has, only has a limited patience for signing and autographing things. So I had, to, I had to tell him that I was going to be using these strictly for the benefiting of user groups and stuff like that, you know. None of this, none of this is going to go to Mad Dog's back pocket or anything. In fact, I have to buy the clock parts to put it together, so. So, I mean, this is a nice thing. I see it as a present, right? I mean, you know, your spouse is looking for something new and unique, you know. And they're going to go down to the store anyway and buy some type of hula dancing clock or something like that. You've got something really neat here, something with historical significance. We sold it. All right. Hundred dollars going once. Hundred and twenty down here. Oh, Patrick, I'm sorry. You know, I. <laughs> you know. You know. But he'll, Linus will be happy that you know he got at least a hundred and twenty dollars for it. $140 down here. This will look really nice in your office, your home. It really will, yeah. Test lab. Test lab, yes. You know, you might be able to hook some things up to the hands and, you know, reset your MTP server. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. All right, so anybody else? What is it, 140 140. 140 going once. 140 going twice. Who said that? Oh, 150 up there in the corner. Okay, $150. That's 50% more than we would have gotten with just the first bid, folks. You know? And it's, it's, it's really not that painful, is it? You know? You should have seen me try to screw the little nuts on the clock together. Now that was painful. And then I had to get the box with the bubble wrap. And this, this box, this box had memory from IBM in it and shipped to me, right? And it's even got my address on it. Now that's got to be worth something. <laughs> 300 for the box. No, no, no. So, 150 up there in the corner, 150 going once. 150 going twice. Patrick, can't you see in your heart the... 160 dollars for Mr. McGovern. <laughs> you know, and Patrick, you've known Lena for a long time, haven't you? Have you ever gotten anything autographed from him? See, he's known Linus for a long time and never had anything autographed. And, and, and he sees them, you know, at, at all these trade shows and stuff. This may be your last chance. 
$160 going what? $160 going, you're not going to let him do this to you, are you? This is Hawaii. You should be buying this and give it to the governor. <laughs> He's going to take it off island. It's going to be all like all those macadamia nuts you guys try and get Mr. Gates to buy. $160 going what? One sixty going twice. Fold for one hundred sixty dollars. <laughs> let's have some drawings and stuff. All right, we'll save the last one for last. Yeah, let's have some drawings and stuff. I'm tired. <laughs> I need I need to save my strength for the shirt. I want you to know that I don't know what's in there, but I didn't put any business cards or anything in there, right? Oh, okay, you got somebody else to draw. Okay. We're going to allow the Hawaiian Nation School to get the most valuable player, my wife, Tina Morgan, to draw the That might be better. Next, we'll be drawing for the PHP 5 Power Programming, autographed by Bruce Perens. And the lucky winner is Timo. Kale you are there. Yay, Timo. And next, we'll be drawing the sign just for you, Linux point and click book featuring the Meepus CD, autographed by our own speaker, Robin Rob Limo Miller. This will be going to our very own Josefian MVP volunteer, Michael Bishop. Those of you wondering about open source software licensing may have had the opportunity to spend time with the esteemed Larry Rosen. We have his book as well. Autograph. It will be going to Paul Moody. All right. Samba 3 by example, written by the highly esteemed John Terpstra, part of the Bruce Perrin series, will be going to Joseph D. Dalmozin. <laughs> Drawing now for the Sun Java long sleeve black shirt, will be going to Oh, this won't be so special to her, but Amy Tilbert of Commercial Data Systems, the local sun reseller. <laughs> Java, application development on Linux, autographed by Bruce Ferenz. 
can't win twice. We'll be going to Daniel Ho. Daniel! The official Samba 3 How To and Reference Guide. Autographed by John Terpstra, Bruce Perrin. We'll be going to Dr. Brett Ellis, Brigham Young University. You will not have the humorous autographing that the esteemed Jim Thompson will get, but Joseph Colton will be taking home Red Hat Fedora Linux 3, autographed by Mad Dog Paul. The white Sun Microsystems polo shirt will be going home with Seth Ladd. But if you're not here, you don't get it. We'll be going to Malaysia with Tan King Ng. Again, thanks to our friends from Novell, heavyweight, all weather umbrella. We'll be going home with Patrick McGovern. If the gray host of t-shirt or polo shirt wasn't enough, we also have a blue host of shirt. This will be going with Ronald Fox. Our second to last exciting all-weather gift will be going to This will be going home with Anthony Eden. But I watched Anthony leave just about 15 minutes ago. Let's hope it's not raining. <laughs> because he will want what Reed Saito has. Yay. And last, from the drawings, courtesy of CompUSA and our dear friend Mike, Michael Pacero, a Palm Zier 21. This is pretty special. You didn't get your card in. It's too late. This will be going home with Paul Lawler. But Paul left earlier. Oh, poor Paul. <laughs> poor Paul. I asked him to stay, too. The benefits of patience will be bestowed upon our very own highly esteemed Department of Education friend, colleague, liaison, and catalyst for change, Brett Tanaka. <laughs> and well deserved. Those are the giveaways. We thank our sponsors who bestowed upon us these kind gifts. And we return to the greatest of all auctions. Now, folks, I want to remind you that this is going to be for the Red Cross and the Sami victims. This is something that the IRS is not going to argue with you on, okay? <laughs> and not only that, but just think about all the things you can do with this T-shirt. You can turn it into a dartboard. <laughs> You can wear it to the next Linux symposium you go to and have people look. Look at all those people's names on there. You know, Robert E. Moe, you know, Bruce Perrin, you know, John Thurpstra, and all those people. You could frame it, like I said, and put it in your office with like glass so it doesn't get dirty, stuff like that. All these things you could do. You know, guys, your wife could wear it as a nightshirt. <laughs> right? I mean, if it's big enough to fit me, just imagine how it would look on her. 
$60 over here in the corner. $100 right down here. 120 I want you to know, and granted it was in a much larger group than this, that we sold a t-shirt like this, actually with fewer signatures, down in Australia. We got 700 Australian dollars for it. That's true. <laughs> no, no, it's not quite that bad. It's, you know, we got 700 Australian dollars for it. And then amazingly, the person who bought it turned it back to have it auctioned off again. We're not asking you to do that. We're going to let you take this home, okay? So what do we have at this point? Was it 100? 120? Okay. Can we do a little bit better than that? The Sami victims? 120? 120 going once? 140 down here. Okay. 140. You know, that's, you know, what is that, about seven bucks for each one of the signatures on there or something like that? Yeah. You know, baseball players would charge you like $20 for a signature, you know? And what do they do? They just play a game. Of course, we have fun. Oh, I don't know. He's, he's holding it up. It's always sees the little globe of Linux on the front here. Huh. 21. Yeah. How about a little bit more? Just a little bit. Oh, up here. 150. All right. Yes. 150 going once. 150 going twice. I know it's out there. 160. I hear it on the I hear it on the wind. 160. 150 going sold for $150. If you're going to make out a check, please make it out to the American Red Cross. And that's it for me. So, grant me one moment to thank everyone for taking the time to come out here. At this point, I have a, a chance to probably meet almost all of you if I didn't already know you or didn't already beg you for a lot of help for us to put this together. Um, my name is Scott Belford, and I've had the real pleasure and honor to, to, to organize a lot of amazing people who, like myself, wholeheartedly believe that there is a lot more opportunity in Hawaii than that which comes from tourism, and we see open source software as a real engine for the economic development that we'd like to see here. And so we put this event together, uh, a bit of a failed attempt at a fundraiser, but a great time and a great opportunity for us to have some amazing people out here. And I want to thank the host of volunteers, many of whom you just, you wouldn't think that they were volunteers. You would think that they were very well-paid professionals the way they execute. Um, but it's for those of you who don't know, um, we all just like the, the open source community um, out of the passion we have for this, uh, find the ways and the time uh, to make this happen. And so whether it's Michael Bishop or Calvin or Daniel or Jeff Cedic or Karen or Ron or Brian or Ted or Paul, all these people in here that do you're not going to take any credit, and you're not going to know, but they found a way in one of the most difficult economies in the country to come up with the time and to come up with the resources and to come up with the help to set up computers and to find, uh, find a way to try to make some change. And so for those of you who we are able to coax into coming here to be a part of this, I want to thank you. This is our inaugural event. Um, we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, we'll You'll be hearing from me come February as I begin planning and preparation for Tipascon 2006. And I hope to have all of you back here. And I managed to get her away from work, and I tried to call attention to her earlier. And um, I very often take uh, a little too much credit for, 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 the, for the things that, um, that I do with, with, with Joseph. But, uh, 
you know, behind every uh, uh, a man is a good woman. And again, this, this, this woman up here to the right is Tina Morgan, and she's an active duty Army nurse. And this entire organization exists because she lets me spend all of our time and our relationship and a lot of her hard-earned money on what we do here. And um, so uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to do this without thanking her a little bit. And as I turn 36 on Sunday, let me just let all of you know that this has been the best birthday party week I think I've had of, uh, of my whole life. And um, we'll make it a little bit better next year. So aloha. Personally, funded quite a bit of this event, so I'd like to hand them, you know, a little extra twenty and say happy birthday. And I'd like to encourage you folks to do the same. Thanks, Brian. Well, this is for hosting. Thank you. I told him he was nuts. I think he's still nuts, yeah. but he made it work. Thank you, Scott. Buzz told me that he's actually turning 24 if you counted in base 16. So he can feel a little bit better, but uh, he worked so hard. Uh, a bunch of us got together. We decided, uh, you know, he works so hard. He needs a little reward. Um, he probably isn't going to accept money. His birthday's coming. So he had some cell phone, cell phone problems recently, so we got him a new cell phone. Buzz, would you bring that over here? fun with your round longer, make a difference, don't stop trying, and uh, keep on keeping on. Thank you.